Welcome back to Global TV Talk Show. As you could see, we are going to be talking about global business today. And our very special guest today is Rebecca Peters, uh, an attorney and uh, just a super connected person in Washington, D.C., uh, and um, a lobbyist and a spokesperson and a, and a get it done kind of person having to do with the semiconductor industry. So please do a self intro a lot better than I could do it. Sure, Ed. Well, uh, good morning, or, or I guess uh, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Rebecca Peters, and I, I work with uh, Samsung Semiconductor. I'm a director of public policy. Uh, on the semiconductor side for the company, and I handle a lot of our, our workforce, immigration, employment, labor, and intellectual property uh, issues. And we've been in the midst of uh, the CHIPS debate and implementation, the CHIPS Act, so that we can expand our manufacturing footprint here in the United States as a company. So we're very excited about that, Ed. Uh, I'll, I'll mention just recently, just last week, uh, we were able uh, to issue our 2023 economic impact report where we have our chip facilities down in Austin and building out our facilities in Taylor, Texas. And we actually doubled our economic impact uh, numbers in Central Texas from 13 billion in 2022 to 26.8 billion of economic contribution and impact in the area. So. You know, we we hope to add uh, tens of thousands of new jobs in the coming years. Uh, we've already added uh, over 18,000 jobs just in direct and indirect construction jobs, just as an example, as we build out these facilities, but uh, very excited about the future. And uh, as Ed mentioned, I have a, a long background, 24 years in Washington, having worked uh, and started at the Department of Justice, Legacy INS and moving on to practice law, and then moving into the uh, trade association space for many years here in Washington. So very uh, comfortable here in Washington and, and doing the work to move the industry forward. So you've been a speaker to Congress and heavily involved in associations getting visibility and helping others uh, get visibility uh, in the Washington uh, milieu of policy development and conversations. A lot of that is networking, isn't it? But it sounds crass to use that word, but it's who knows you, not just who you know. No, that's that's absolutely correct. And I think, you know, as you think about uh, how you want to be successful in in Washington as you think about how to kind of really get your your advocacy across in Washington because Washington can also al almost always at times be dysfunctional. Um, you've really got to lead with uh, effective communicating uh, internally with your company or with your clients. Uh, and, and that means just being very transparent about what's going on on the ground here in Washington, uh, setting reasonable expectations. Uh, it means, you know, raising your company or your client's visibility as you're talking about, Ed, on the ground, which means, you know, you use the word networking, but it really is uh, a great word to describe it uh, because you are you are networking as you make contacts and build contacts and maintain relationships both uh, in Congress and in the administration where you know we can have any sort of public policy uh, move forward and we wanna make sure that we are influencing that to the best of our ability for your company or your clients. Uh, and the other way you can really be impactful in Washington is to make sure that you are working with the experts on the ground, uh, whether that's coalitions or trade associations and making sure you're positioning yourself into leading um, uh, positions, whether it's chairing committees for a trade association or you know helping lead uh, an executive committee of a coalition. These are all things that I think help you advocate well on the ground in Washington and, and raise your visibility to your point. 
Thank you very much for that deep dive. Let's talk uh, about uh, the role. Uh, what we're talking about is international business and international talent and the ability or the need for companies, particularly here in the U.S., to build a pipeline, a worker pipeline of qualified individuals, highly educated, in order to satisfy Samsung's and other chip makers, uh, the need for excellent talent. So as you could see, uh, part of our logo here is mobile talent <laughs> and global business, and that means immigration. So everything is really looped together, and it's almost like a an electrified third rail today because it's such a political issue, isn't it? Oh, it definitely is. And I think, you know, just talking from my experience with Samsung over the last two and a half years and, and working to pass the CHIPS Act through Congress, and now we're implementing uh, the law, we know, and, and I know our immigration friends and global mobility friends around the world know this, Ed, but we here in the United States have a, a shortfall of about 1.4 million STEM workers uh, wow. across the economy. We know in the semiconductor industry, nearly 70,000 of those, um, we will have the gap uh, of those semiconductor technicians, engineers, and computer scientists over the next five years as we are you know, rapidly expanding the semiconductor industry uh, to make chips here in the United States. And so immigration um, is extremely key uh, to work alongside building our U.S. worker pipeline. Uh, it is really the element that right now uh, that is currently just dealing with the reality that uh, over 50% of those graduating out of our U.S. universities and advanced degree and Ph.D. STEM courses are foreign nationals. Hmm. That is the pool of individuals we have to work with. Um, when we get into some of these very specific uh, jobs and spaces, uh, specifically at, at Samsung with engineering. Uh, and so I think, you know, while we might be able at Samsung to build out our, our U.S. worker workforce with our technicians at our chip facilities, the example is immigration really plays a huge role for us when we're talking about highly educated, highly skilled engineers and researchers as we work in the semiconductor space. But I know this is a reality across many industries. So extremely critical to what we're doing uh, at this time, Ed. So as Americans, we shouldn't be afraid of this. We should welcome it. That's right. Um, these individuals complement our workforce. Uh, there's been numerous studies over the past two decades that show that uh, these key foreign national workers uh, actually grow US jobs. Uh, anywhere between three to five jobs a worker, uh, depending on the report you're looking at. So it really is a benefit to the nation's uh, economic competitiveness, as well as as national security. So these people are well paid, which means they're yes. they're paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> they're very well paid. And um, at least, you know, very well paid. And they are contributing to our, our economic input here in the U.S. Absolutely. Okay, that's that's really good just that we get that on the record here. Okay, so this, this program is not political, but of course we're talking about politics and about uh, getting things done. Um, so let's talk about Samsung in the U.S. It's been in the U.S. since uh, last century, right? Yeah, we've actually uh, been in the U.S. At, uh, at least on the semiconductor side since uh, 1996, but we've been in the U.S. as a company since the uh, 1970s. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, we've been and we were the first uh, foreign headquartered company. For those of you that don't know, Samsung is headquartered in Seoul, South Korea, uh, but we were the first foreign national headquartered company to start producing chips in the United States. And we started doing that in 1996. So we've been a part of the U.S. market for quite some time. Uh, it is one of our top, if not our top customer base, which is why we're we're really excited to continue to expand our, our presence here. So the onshoring, in other words, mm -hmm. bringing manufacturing into the U.S., 
uh, that used to be done uh, in other places. This is uh, it's a smart policy, of course. Now, STEM, STEM, that basically science, technology, and engineering, what? engineering and, and math. And that, excuse me, that's not just for semiconductors. That's for healthcare. That's for medicine. A lot of industries, even finance. Even Wall Street utilizes these people. Um, so yeah, it's it's across the board, Ed. And um, a lot of tech companies um, beyond us are using it, as you mentioned, healthcare, uh, as you mentioned, um, research facilities. I mean, there's a whole, uni universities are utilizing these individuals. Um, you know, it's it's a whole host of industries that are actually using this talent. So when I was a kid, I mean, we're talking about education systems and gearing up for being able to comprehend and learn the stuff. And but when I was a kid, I didn't get that, I had no clue. I was really an expert at watching cowboy movies on TV and uh, I Love Lucy and Superman and things like that, but not scientific no scientific education other than I don't even remember anything until we got to high school and I took by, uh, uh, you know, biology, which I got to be in somehow. <laughs> so today's kids, oh, yeah, they're on the computer when they're two. Oh you yeah, know, on, on the phone. Oh, yeah. No, it's much more integrated now. I'll, I'll give the example. My uh, seven-year-old niece, and even when she was much younger, I, I go visit her out in Montana, where my family's from. And I think, you know, she's doing STEM camp. Uh, they're doing STEM presentations in <laughs> school at seven. Uh, you know, I think one year she did something on the, the, you know, a crystal and how it has the prism on it. And she did something completely different this year on like, Plants, I don't know. Uh, she also is extremely wow. computer savvy. Uh, when I was there, I was taking a nap. She came in. She somehow figured out how to unlock my mobile phone and took <laughs> pictures of me. Took pictures of me napping with her making you know silly faces in the picture. So you know these kids are are light years beyond us, Ed. Light years. That's <laughs> but it is something amazing. It is amazing, but it is something, you know, I will say in the semiconductor space, and as we have more critical and emerging technologies, that we have to get out there as industries and educate about these opportunities, how you actually get into these fields. This is one of the reasons we don't have as many folks uh, working in the semiconductor industry, because I think until maybe three years ago, people didn't really throw around the word semiconductor as casually as they do today. It wasn't something that was really understood. And so we have a lot to do as an industry, which we are working to do, uh, to really build out appropriate semiconductor courses and make sure that kids in K through 12 are aware that these are opportunities for them. And, you know, make sure that we have ways in which underrepresented communities, for instance, can get involved in uh, the industry, something that we are working hard to do under the CHIPS and Science Act. Uh, one example is, you know, not much is moving through Congress these days, except for maybe the funding legislation. But we do anticipate, for example, uh, a vote on the House suspension calendar very soon for the bipartisan Pell Act, which uh, is going to expand Pell Grant opportunities to uh, individuals in short-term uh, uh, training, you know, eight to 10 weeks. So that's really critical, like for instance, for our technicians in the semiconductor industry to open up opportunities for those people. So a lot that can be done and that we're, we're looking to do uh, as we move ahead. So let's just talk a little bit about Congress. Um, sure. You know, uh, it is uh, February 27 and March 1 and March 8 are critical funding uh, dates uh, and, and threat of a shutdown or continuing resolution to uh, take care of something. I mean, all this is in the air right now. 
um, and there's a lot of uh, politics or discussions going on right now as we speak. So it was really high stakes at this moment in time. Once again, today is Feb 27, 2024. So let me talk you know, let me get some guidance from you. Your insight is very, very uh, acute and special in this regard because of your experience in Washington, in Congress, connected with the Semiconductor Association for training and development amongst other groups that you're a part of. Why don't you tell us about some of these groups that you're involved with and, and why those are tied into exactly what we have been talking about? Sure, Ed. Well, I mean, there are a, a number of coalitions and trade associations in town that uh, many in the tech industry uh, beyond the, the semiconductor companies are, are involved in uh, and advocating not only to, to grow our U.S. worker pipeline uh, here in the United States, but also advocating uh, for moving forward any sort of benefit we can get in the high-skilled immigration space. Uh, so these are groups like Compete America, the Compete America Coalition. And actually, uh, I'm proud to say our Compete America retreat this week on Thursday and Friday uh, is being hosted at Samsung. So we're very involved. Uh, but last retreat, we had Amazon, you know, host <laughs> the retreat. So we are are constantly working with within coalitions to to move various issues forward. Uh, another example I'll give is we are are very uh, much uh, a US chamber member. We are very much uh, a semiconductor industry association member. I, I utilize both those trade associations for very different things. Uh, for instance, the semiconductor industry association, uh, I chair their workforce committee. And we are working to put forward a, a second paper. Uh, we put out a great paper last year about the skills gap numbers we would, would have in the semiconductor space that I referenced earlier. But we're working on a whole set of that Congress do now to help us fill our US worker skills gaps. Like I mentioned, the Pell Grant, the Perkins Act will be reauthorized next year. Uh, there's a whole host of things um, beyond just grants that the administration can do to help us get the talent we need. Uh, the chamber has been very helpful, for example, uh, in helping us defend against uh, some of the more aggressive Department of Labor rules that we've seen coming out on the independent contractor rule, the, the joint employer liability rule. We're anticipating an OSHA walk around rule where actually in the coming months, uh, the Department of Labor could finalize that and OSHA and an Office of Safety and Health coming to inspect uh, your employer facility could walk around the site with a union member, a labor union member who is not an employee of the company. So it, it could be a, an anti-fossil fuel advocate that's walking around with an OSHA agent at your site who's not an employee. So there's a lot of things the chamber is helping us um, deal with that are, are challenges in the immigration space through litigation and, and other things that the chamber is, is very good at doing. Uh, and of course, you know, we continue to advocate on, on immigration through numerous trade associations and coalitions, as I mentioned, Compete America, um, ITI, and uh, also the Semiconductor Industry Association uh, to kind of, you know, move the needle forward where we can. Uh, we actually just got some really great um, outcomes with the Department of State uh, issuing their visa revalidation um, pilot program. Uh, and we continue to work in the H-1B modernization rule space and, and other spaces I'm, I'm happy to talk about. But we, we get a lot of value out of working in these, these group environments. You mentioned earlier the Pell Grants. Now, this is a, a political act that goes back years. Uh, it's a funding uh, mechanism for uh, special education. Uh, mm -hmm. And and now you're talking about uh, a plan to expand the scope and the deliverable 
of the Pell Grant so that more kids uh, who are from underprivileged uh, areas, but who have a capability or a capacity for learning will get funding. That's right, Ed. And and this is just a bill that we, we learned a couple of weeks ago would be put on the House suspension calendar, H.R. 6585. It's the Bipartisan Workforce Pell Act. It's, it's, I just use it as an example of something that is... Oh, I couldn't hear you right now. Sorry, Ed. Um, so okay. I, I was just saying that uh, we are supporting um, one of the only other bipartisan uh, acts in Congress right now that has a chance of moving forward, uh, other than the, the tax extender bill or the funding bills, which is H.R. 6585, the Bipartisan uh, Workforce Pell Act. And it's just one example of something that could be done now to help us grow our, our U.S. Uh, STEM uh, worker pipeline, as you mentioned, for underprivileged individuals. Um, currently, the, the law allows individuals who are working toward a, a bachelor's um, degree, for instance, to receive grant funding, but they are under this bill expanding uh, that to include a short-term training. Uh, and that would incorporate, for instance, our semiconductor technicians, where we have a shortage of workers of over, you know, 20,000 workers over the next five years. So it, it does give opportunities to those that are uh, maybe more underrepresented, um, economically disadvantaged. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, something we're, we're supporting and watching. We think oh. it has a good chance. You, uh, yeah, you you just cut out again, but I think you said you said uh, that uh, it has a good chance of passing the House. Yeah, okay, good. All right, as we come to a close here in the next couple of minutes, and there's an abbreviated session today, and I do welcome you to come back again when you have more time. Uh, the, the mood in Congress, uh, this being a political year, is... Uh, uh, crazy making in my view <laughs> and uh, and all of this still has to get done and I would think that uh, your experience in Washington is, is thrilling actually with all this action going on so take us out of this uh, today by you know describing what's your typical day um, with all this going on <laughs> sure uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll give the example maybe just of today. I'll, I'll use today as an example. You know, the, the days vary, but you're right. We're in the middle of this uh, funding deadline where we could likely see a, a short-term CR or a, a really a, a short-term shutdown happen uh, if Speaker Johnson doesn't get his four first appropriations bills uh, done by Friday, which is is looking less and less likely. Uh, and I, I think, you know, my days kind of revolve around, um, number one, our top priority is, is moving our, our CHIPS implementation forward. But for instance, today I woke up and, and had some calls preparing for uh, helping to lead our high-skilled immigration retreat at Samsung. Uh, later this week, I am uh, then had a coalition call. I, I now am speaking to a group of you. Uh, I will head to the office soon and, and uh, we will get uh, the latest briefing from some of our consultants on what's happening in the current political environment. Uh, I will then stay to have conversations with them about setting up some high-skilled immigration briefings on the Hill uh, and strategy there. Uh, I then might talk to some of my peer companies in the chips uh, space to, to catch up on, on recent ongoings where we are um, being asked as a community to sign labor union neutrality letters. And then we actually have a call with our leadership tonight in South Korea at eight o'clock, which is a weekly call we have. Uh, they're 13 hours ahead of us. So it, these are pretty long days in Washington. But like you said, Ed, there's always a lot going on and and never uh, really uh, any sort of lack of, of new issues to be covering. Well, I'm really honored to have you uh, on on uh, Global TV here. Please come back and uh, 
Stay safe and be well. Thank you so much, Ed, for the opportunity. We look forward to coming back. Thank you.